software is fundamentally changing. And if you look at the Israeli companies, like whenever the cloud providers are putting out a new feature, you see the Israeli companies grabbing it first, playing with it, adopting it, and then making it better. Right. Welcome to 20 Minute Leaders. Just sit back, relax, and learn from the leaders of today. It's a journey. Each one is different, unique, inspiring. Let's get started. This episode is powered by Jay Ventures, a community-driven VC fund in Silicon Valley in partnership with Loomi Tech and sponsored by Hippo Insurance, Turing, Upwest Labs, and Hillel at Stanford. These next 20 minutes are going to be all about the Israeli tech scene, all about investing, society, what needs to happen, what is happening, and why Ben is so excited about being the managing partner and founder of Amiti Ventures. Ben is the founder and managing partner of Amiti Ventures, a U.S.-Israel venture firm founded in 2010. Amiti has seeded or been an early-stage investor of Innoviz, Psychognito, Next Silicon, Valence, Viar, Demostack, Dataloop, and many more. Previously at AutoCodes, Ben had responsibilities that included M&A, product strategy, product marketing, business development, and North American operations. He also acted as a general manager of acquired companies, among other responsibilities. Ben has an MBA from Georgetown University. Ben Rabinowitz, thank you for joining me on 20 Minute Leaders. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I love your office. We're oh, on the, the, we're on a very, very high floor of the Rothschild 22. I have a little bit of fear of heights, but the view from here is spectacular. And, uh, and I just love coming here. The atmosphere is so great. You're investing in such incredible companies. Uh, I met with your partner Modi before, and I'm great friends with Aviv, and I can't wait to now meet you in these 20 minutes. You founded Amiti. I believe 11 years ago, yep. U.S. Israeli VC, with some pretty clear thesis as to what types of companies you want to invest in. And from what I'm seeing uh, you, the, throughout the investments and throughout the funds, there's a pretty clear trajectory as to what interests you and how you think of the world. And so tell me a bit, a bit about the founding of Amiti. What, okay. what led you to, to, to think of this firm? Okay, sure. Well, first, thanks for coming and, and you're safe, so don't have any fears here. Um, so... 11 years ago was like during a, a terrible economic crisis, a huge financial crisis in the world. It was coming up there um, with mortgages and the banks being in trouble and then spreading through through the rest of the world, through all kinds of economies. And I was kind of contrarian at the time, thinking this like is a really good time to start a company. This is a great time to be an entrepreneur and be a founder. And I want to play offense, not while everyone's playing defense. Um, Israel at that time, if you looked at the venture community, uh, there's different reports about what the numbers were, but it ranges from maybe $800 million, maybe a little over a billion dollars was the size of all venture being invested in Israel That's it. in the year 2010, which, you know, for those that don't know, in comparison, today, it's not strange to have a month of, you know, $1.3, $1.5 billion of venture investing. In Literally 10, 11 X. Right. So a huge, huge leap. But at that point... The VCs had to really focus on their portfolio companies, keep them alive, get through the crisis. And there was very little um, uh, new investing happening in terms of you know, companies that were getting started. So, so I just thought it was a great time uh, uh, to jump in. Of course, for years, I've been preparing myself. I had you know, bought companies through, you know, I was work in previous companies that I was working with, I would be doing M&A and I'd buy companies, I'd run them, the, the companies we acquired or I had done product strategy. I dealt with investors. I had dealt with a lot of things that you needed to be a very, you know, to be a successful VC in terms of operational experience, investor experience, um, investing itself. Um, so I had the tools, and then the timing seemed to me right. Um, of course, the challenge is then how do you find investors that want to play offense when they're scared, <laughs> um, and they're they've lost a lot of that. You know, they see their the value of their investments going down. And here along comes Ben says, Let, "Let's go." Right. And I was fortunate. I found some uh, people that really bought into into what I wanted to do. They bought into me. Remember, I'd never been I'd never been a VC before. So I was really jumping in some uh, uh, into something new and, and, and people really had to get behind me, but they did. Um, and so that that's why, you know, I, I just thought the timing was was really good to, to jump in. Um, by the way, at that time, I uh, I was meeting with VCs in Israel and um, I was living in the States, um, but I had met Modi and he was one of the really? guys who encouraged me and says, you're a VC, you should jump in, you should do it. Um, so, uh, so I did. And, um, 
And then the strategy is, which has been the same strategy for all these years, which is I'm looking for, always looking for teams that have some real ingenuity from a technology standpoint, um, that they seem to be the right team for the mission that they're going after, um, that they're going after big, big being disrupted. And, and again, the timing seems right. And I don't care if it's con contrary and if everyone's running in that direction or not running in that direction. But if I feel if I have those ingredients, um, then it makes sense to, uh, you know, to jump in and, and invest. In companies. So it, the right team for the right mission. So a, a lot of times I hear of them of these as two fragmented questions. Is this a good team? Is this a good problem to solve? I, I don't often hear the integration of the two as, as a sort of, if you look at this as a machine learning model and think of it as a, as a unique feature on its own, the integrate that it's the right team for the right problem, right? right? Well, what does that actually mean to you? So to me, it's like you see that all the right, uh, a lot of the skill sets that are needed from a, maybe it's from a technology standpoint is, is there, or maybe there's some experience with uh, on the marketing side. You know, if I, you know, if I take successful investments, like let's take Innovis as an example. So why are they the right team for the mission? Maybe most people would look at it in 2016 and say, they don't seem like the right team for the mission to go out of, after the automotive industry and build the core sensor that will enable semi-autonomous and autonomous cars. But I looked at them and uh, first of all, they came from great experience from uh, having worked together in the 81 unit, which to me means you know how to really build products. Uh, they knew each other well. Um, they each had certain technologies that they knew that was very, a uh, LiDAR is a combination of a lot of technologies. And um, in their previous startups or what they had done in the unit were, was the type of technology background that you needed. And then on the business side, while there wasn't much, um, still like, for example, if I take Oren, one of the co-founders, he had been working at BCG and they had some automotive clients and he had some knowledge of, you know, kind of where to focus from uh, the market. And, and we actually worked together trying to figure out what's the addressable market, what's the market timing and stuff wow. like that. And when you looked at the market, actually, um, you know, some of my team were really against it because there were some PhDs that had another company that had from uh, from the West Coast uh, that had, uh, uh, you know, that seemed that maybe they might be state of the art and leading edge. And, you know, my view was uh, if I have to bet, you know, guys coming out 81 versus PhDs and you have to build a very complex product, I'd always go with the the 81 team. So. That's how I saw it was the right team for the mission. And I knew that they could immediately attract tens and tens of, and then eventually hundreds of the most talented engineers. So they were magnets. Um, so that to me was the definition of the right team for the mission. Maybe others would say, I want someone that's automotive, that's worked at BMW. Yeah, that's not the right team for the mission for me. It's like those types of ingredients that I, you know, it's a, Take some intuition, but that's kind of how I looked at it. And so now we're in 2021. It's the third uh, fund uh, and uh, Innovis and just like a lot of other companies, incredible companies. Thinking forward, Israel, you're, you're very involved in the Israel ecosystem. You're talking about 81, 8200. A lot of the, you know, the different experiences that Israelis may have that may provide them an edge in, in going and executing on these really challenging problems, not just academically, but tangibly in the market. Where, where in your eyes are we headed? You've seen, the, you've seen this grow for 10 years. What needs to happen so that Israel can maintain its competitive edge in these regards? Because we're seeing a lot of other countries advancing and a lot of incredible people coming and doing amazing things. Right. So first I'll talk a little bit what I see currently and then also going future. Uh, currently, um, when uh, I kind of see Israel and Silicon Valley actually creating even more of a gap with the rest of the world right now. And I say that because, you know, we've obviously gone through the year of uh, the tragedy of, of COVID-19, um, which also helped accelerate a lot of things like um, online retail, telemedicine, et cetera. Uh, and we also saw more movement from um, on-prem to cloud. And, and then we also saw from a software perspective, moving from like monolithic software to microservices, et cetera. Software is fundamentally changing. And... If you look at the Israeli companies, like whenever the cloud providers are putting out a new feature, you see the Israeli companies grabbing it first, playing with it, adopting it, and then making it better. Right. And so when I look at what are the key technology trends, I see both the Valley and Israel as the 
These are the teams that are being the early adopters and grabbing it. Okay, if I just take that one example of microservices and going from monolithic software to you know to breaking it into services and 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 all the shift left and development tools and cybersecurity that's needed for it, you don't see it happening in Europe. You don't see it happening in other parts of the world, um, but you see it like like in Silicon Valley in Israel. It seems like it's mainstream when actually. I think we're like in the first inning of a nine inning game, right? Of 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 these technologies, but um, but Israel's just racing ahead. So that's why I see with that, with cybersecurity, with semiconductors, there are certain sectors where Israel, with data compute, uh, certain sectors where Israel's really moving very nicely along, and of course always with Silicon Valley too in that symbiotic relationship, um, and 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 creating a bigger gap between them and the, and the rest of the world. So that's what's exciting. Long-term, I mean, Israel definitely has, every country has its challenges. Uh, we have challenges here. Um, I think the education system is not what it needs to be. So um, both from K through 12 um, and at the universities and keeping the best professors and, you know, from PhDs, postdocs, researchers, et cetera, right. Uh, we need to keep trying to do much better, give mu much a lot more resources, and get much higher quality uh, people. You know, uh, a teaching profession should not be a volunteer. It should be that you should be able to live well and be and, and educate the youth in the country. Um, right. So I think that's you know one. And then of course integrating all the communities. I mean, we have to first of all we have to do a big push on on women issues and you know gender equality. We need to uh, obviously get the ultra orthodox and the Arab community much more involved in in high tech. Uh, I think those are are critical things. Now, why yeah. why why I agree, but well, why are they critical things in your in your eyes? Because until now we're talking about a very specific small subset of the Israeli ecosystem, right? We're talking about you know when we say you know eighty eight one graduates or eighty two hundred graduates, we're talking about hundreds of people, not millions, right? Here and here you're saying. Alongside, in order to keep the momentum and keep the competitive edge, we need to account for the entire population and integrate them into society and into the professional society. Why is that? Why is that an important? Well, property? first, from a society standpoint, I think we're we're in a, a dangerous place, both in Israel and the United States, and yeah. in many places around the world. Is that there's two economies? Okay, in Israel, coming out of COVID, the tech sector thrived. We took off. We weren't worried about our jobs. In fact, we couldn't find enough engineers, enough people to fill jobs. Okay, but yet the other part of the Israeli economy, you know, and it, whether it's Israel or the United States, it's the same. But the other part of the Israeli economy really, really suffered uh, for this past year. Lots of unemployment, um, a lot of displacement. It was, it was tough. Still and, is, and it still is. And and one of the best solutions is bring them into tech. We can. We're outsourcing so much to other countries. There's no reason. It's better if we're all working in the same office and building our R&D centers bigger and bigger. So, um, so being able to bring, we need these communities to get in because we don't have enough. We're not going to have enough engineers to continue to scale up. So if right. we want to continue to scale up, we need uh, uh, these communities to come in. In addition to that, I would also say, you know, we have to think about our immigration policy too. Um, you know, the, the best engineers in the world wake up in the morning saying, I want to get myself to Silicon Valley and compete against the best. Okay. But they would also love to come here too. So why not take 5,000, 10,000 of the best engineers every year and, and give them a path to citizenship in Israel, you know? Right. So, um, so I think if we want to remain, a, if we want to be a superpower in tech in Israel, we have to get all the communities involved. We have to get the best engineers to want to be here um, because we clearly have the entrepreneurial spirit, the know-how, the guts, you know, to to build great companies. Right. Um, so those are things that I think we need to work And on. I love the distinction about the, the idea of scaling up. And I think we're, we're at a sort of inflection point. And I think really January of 2021 has been an inflection point where we're seeing, you know, the number of companies that that, that declared going public or through a SPAC merger just in January of 2021 is half the companies that ever went public, you know, from the Israel ecosystem. And we're seeing, you know, scale up nation instead of exit nation or startup nation. Mm -hmm. And this whole question of, you know, building the R&D, we, we haven't seen really Israeli companies building 
thousands of people R&D centers in Israel. And, and this is something that's pretty fresh to the ecosystem. And as a fresh young entrepreneur, I'm excited to see, you know, how, how, this, how this ecosystem is evolving. And it's pretty exciting. Here you're meeting, you know, hundreds of, of companies a year, mm -hmm. hundreds of, uh, you know, early stage companies, later stages sometimes. But wh what are some things that you're observing as you're meeting founders? Because I, I imagine that pretty quickly, you know, whether you want to advance and pretty quickly you have some, you're developing some intuitions. Yep. What are some of the, of the sort of the do's and don'ts in, in your eyes? Okay. Um, so first of all, I agree to, about the, the scaling. I think just actually, if you take the second fund of Amiti, um, we should know this in the next month or two, but basically half of our companies will be unicorns. Half of the companies in, in Amiti what? too. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so we're, um, again, there's a, some, uh, right now we're almost half, but we will be, we'll make, I think we're going to make it there within the next month or two. So um, big news are coming. Okay. Yeah. So, um, in terms of what we're looking for, I mean, first of all, you know, it's, uh, there's usually two or three people, you know, founders, um, and it's really important that they're all strong and they're all, um, it's kind of the right team. They, they've known each other for a while. They didn't just like date. Uh, essentially over the last two months and now they're meeting with us. You know, if they've worked together in the past, that's a huge, huge value. Um, we actually like, uh, we, we of course like serial entrepreneurs, but statistically we're better investors with first timers. Really? Um, so we like, because first timers are, they have so much passion. Their company become, is their identity. This is like what they're thinking about 24 seven um and so we really do love uh, uh the first timers and we also love when they realize that they don't have to find like maybe it's two guys and they've been working together in the past and they're you know both technical and someone says oh you need to now go find your business person and we think that's really bad advice um as long as one person is even if they're both introverts if one person can fake being an extrovert from time to time, uh, then that's good enough. And, um, and we'd much rather, because when you bring in a business person and you say, okay, this person's going to be the CEO, the CEO actually makes all the critical, the key decisions. So when there's a, a trade-off on what feature to do or what to do with the product or to, to pivot or which customers to focus on, or, you know, you're handing that over to someone who, you know, is looking at this as a kind of like, okay, it's a nice gig for me to do next. Um, we'd rather you, if the, if you have two people, three people, and you're like, you've worked together and you're excited, you know, go, go try to do it by yourself before trying to bring in, uh, you know, a business person. Is there something that ticks you off? Something that, some things that, you know, maybe frustrate you throughout the process or that you feel like, ah, it, it, like why you didn't have to do that. All right. So one obviously is when a, a great technical founder, joins with a, a business person that is not that impressive. That's frustrating. Um, but the, uh, the other thing is, is um, look, we love to brainstorm with, and, and if the point of the meeting is to just brainstorm, then that's great. If you're coming to a meeting because you're actually wanting to raise money right now and you're not really prepared. And what I mean by prepared is you don't know your market that well. I mean, I don't care about what the slides look like. That's really not important to me. Okay. Um, and uh, so what is knowing? What, what does it mean to know? You, you've spoken to potential customers. You've spoken to whoever's in, in the middle of the value chain and the partners. Um, you, you didn't just have like a good meeting with someone and they said, yeah, if you had that, that would be really cool. But they like, it's a real pain. Like they, you're, you're solving a big problem. And they said, give it to me, make this right away. And I want to be your design partner. Um, that's what we want to hear. But if you're just sad, like, look, I have 30 logos. I've talked to all these people. And all, all you really had was a 20 minute conversation or a 15 minute conversation here and there. Um, that's not so interesting. Um, you know, if you show me a data point that says this market's going to be $50 billion, but you have no way to tell me how you justify why it's that big, even if, or a billion dollars or whatever it is. Um, so just know the market, like what's, you know, it, it's also okay to say, I don't have no idea what the potential is, but I know that I'm solving a real problem. Right. You know, that I'm, I'm fine with that, you know? So, so know the customer, know the market, and then and then with the technology, really know it. So if you're going to talk about, oh, yeah, we're going to do AI and machine learning, 
we're going to be asking you, we're going to drill you like to see like exactly what you're doing. And so, you know, and a, a lot of times we find out that there's actually no a- AI required right. to do the product. So, um, so I think those are, are, are some of the things, but again, if it's a brainstorming discussion, if we set it up that way, we'd love to help companies or, or founders go through a couple months of brainstorming before they're ready to actually right. raise money. Then, then you don't need to be prepared. You know, we'll help you think of how to prepare. And that's the real due diligence. It's that relationship that you build over months and you, and you see how the, how the founders are working uh, over, over a stretch of time and not over a series of a few meetings, which makes it, it that makes the due diligence process much harder because right. there's a lot more question marks that you're trying to fill in the gaps. It's like you're saying that you're seeing some words blackened out and you're trying to, uh, to fill in from other spec, extrapolate from other data points that you have. Right. But the one way that we short, which is great about how you short circuit the process in Israel, and, and this is where it's, it's not fair, but it's, I mean, it's, it is what it is, is that those that do come from the units, okay, our ability to very quickly figure out what did your commander think? What did the other team leaders think of you? What did your soldiers think of you? Um, did, did you really work together on a project together or did you, you know, pass each other in a hallway, you know, right. um, and when you're working in, in, in your, in the same unit, you know, um, we can, the, one of the great things from investing in Israel is we can short circuit the process of due diligence so quickly, um, because it's, a, a essentially a, 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 a small community. One degree of um, separation. Right. Whereas in the States, if there's someone from Georgia who were, who's teamed up with someone from Seattle, and they uh, they got a third founder in LA, and now they've kind of come together. How do you, you know, right. how do you have the tools to figure? You know, uh, it's so much easier here. I mean, there are ways to do that. Obviously, there's really good VCs in the US that invest in US companies, but it's a lot easier, you know, you know, to do it here. Completely agree. Ben, are you ready for some fun questions? Okay, I'll try. All right. <laughs> First one: favorite subject in school. All right, a little boring, but um, I loved history. You uh, loved history. Yeah. Um, I love uh, um, just seeing what how leaders dealt with very tough uh, tough situations. I love learning about other countries, other cultures, uh, problems they had to deal with. Um, I think we can learn a lot from history. Uh, I, I think it builds up our value system because as much as we like to think that all oh, the world's going in the wrong direction, and there are problems obviously in the world, but you know, if you think about like, what was the world really like in the 1960s? And what was the world really like in the yeah. 1940s? And what, you know, and, or, or 300 years ago, uh, you realize that we're progressing so, so much on so many areas and we still have a lot. And of course, 40 years from now, we'll look at today's period and say, wow, we were really, how we, were we, we drove cars, it? you know, but, um, and how did we even think that way? And that's so immoral, but, yes. you know, but, uh, so it's it's nice to uh, look over history and 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 there's things to be proud of and things to be ashamed of, but it's good to to but learn from them. To learn from them, yeah. Role model. So on this theme of history, um, I'll just give a genre that I um, there are uh, especially political leaders that I've always looked at and and in the ways political leaders were the startups, were the founders or the uh, entrepreneurs of, of their day. You know, if you think about in Israel, of course. Uh, David Ben Gurion, of course, he was in a way an entrepreneur, building up a country and and having to make super hard decisions. You know, if you look at an Abraham Lincoln or Winston Churchill, um, there's just so many leaders in the past. Um, uh, or if you look at uh, Martin Luther King, what he was able to do when he was 31, 32 years old, and be a leader of a of a civil rights movement and inspire the world. Um, yeah, I, I, I kind of get a lot of inspiration from those kind of leaders, and I love to read books, you know, on them. So, right. Yeah. And three words you would choose to describe yourself. So first, I'm definitely a dad or an Abba. Um, so that's the first thing I think about when I wake up in the morning, and it's, uh, it's my top priority. <laughs> so, um, so everything else is, uh, is, is second to that. Um, but then I would say Amiti, like when yeah. you're an entrepreneur and you're a founder, um, you don't know the difference in the identity between the name of, of, of the company you've built and, and who you are. Like, I don't know what's Ben, what's Amiti. It's like, we're it's all together. Um, and then, is that the origin of the name, Amiti? The origin of the name is, um, actually, my daughter and I did this, like, she was like nine years old at the time. 
and or 10 years old. And uh, we spent basically two hours working on it. Um, really? So um, well, I'll give a big secret to the world, which is always start your company with a letter A or an olive because you want to present at conferences early. Um, but um, the other was we were looking for something that was easy to say in English that had a nice Hebrew meaning and was an acronym. And we, uh, I was in Chicago, we were living in Chicago and we were raising money in Chicago. So we thought, okay, accelerating Midwest Israel technology investments. Um, and that combined with, we liked the meaning in Hebrew. It was easy to say in English. And that's, that's how we ended up with that. Um, so, so that was two. That was two. Um, we have dad, we have Amiti. And I would just say, um, you know, just, uh, it's something between, I don't know, it's this, it's hard. To, I'm choosing between resilience, focus, and also thinking big. There's a lot um, of slashes in between. A lot okay. of slashes between those, but that, you know, some, all those kind of. Ben, kind of thank you there. very, very much. I love what you guys are doing here. Uh, it's, it, I love the process and I, I love the, the strategic thinking, playing offense in 2010 and when, when everybody's playing defense, but thinking critically about you know, the Israel ecosystem, not just as the tech ecosystem, but as society and how society together is, is, is a part of the Israeli story of both the startup nation, but also the scale up nation to working with the founders and understanding what does it mean to have a good team uh, for the right problem and, and measuring that team through, through a real relationship process and not just through a transactional meeting where you're trying to evaluate whether the, the whether their unit economics are working. Uh, I just love the whole mindset uh, and obviously the origin of, um, of the word Amiti. That's, okay. uh, that's the best part of all. Great. Well, thanks so much for coming. And, and I like how you personalize things and get everyone to see each other as an individual and, and part of a, a doing the larger good. So Thank you very so much. much.